So welcome everyone to Independent Filmmaker Day. We're excited to have everybody here. Uh, we have a terrific set of panels throughout the day running from 3 p.m. Eastern to 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is David Rubenstein. I'm the founder of Independent Filmmaker Day. I am an entertainment attorney and producer. Uh, some of the projects I've worked on in the past are projects like 1917, uh, where I helped raise funding and we were excited that I won three Oscars. I also uh, recently worked on the project Human Capital, uh, which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival on the red carpet with Marissa Tomei and Lee Shriver, and currently working on uh, about 20 different projects at all different stages of funding, all different stages of development. And the goal is really to add value to you and your projects. And the reason we decided to put on Independent Filmmaker Day is because as a, an attorney and producer, I'd often get asked the question, I've got a script or I've got an idea, what do I do next? And so we created Independent Filmmaker Day to help fill that void. We found that there's really a lack of information out there and that you can't get from film school, you can't get from books, you can't get from online about how do you take your project or dream and turn it into reality. And so we created this to bring in speakers on all different topics in the film and TV industry, ranging from directors, actors, and producers, but also to distributors, post-production, legal, insurance, music, uh, every single piece that you need to help turn your film and to be part of your team. And so we have a, an amazing lineup today, especially we're privileged and honored to have the Creative Coalition here with us today. And we are honoring them with our IFD, Independent Filmmaker Day Excellence in Filmmaking Award uh, for their work in bringing to the screen short films with an impact and purpose. And we're privileged uh, to bring to, to you today uh, featuring films such as You Just Big Boned, Fat Life, and Saint Nick. And I have with, here with us Robin Bronk, who is the uh, CEO of the Creative Coalition. Welcome, Robin. Hi, David. Thank you so much. It is really tremendous and great to be here with you on Independent Filmmaker Day with your 550,000 uh, members and viewers and might be 552,000 because I told my parents about it. I don't know if they figured out the whole thing, but um, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to, to keep IFD, uh, you know, keep those numbers up. Um, so the Creative Coalition, as David talked about initially, we are the nonprofit arm of the entertainment industry. Our members are actors, writers, producers, directors, executives, um, really every aspect of the entertainment industry that cares about the world. And our whole mission is how do we use the arts, entertainment to change uh, the way people think, to move, to move the social welfare needle, needle in a positive direction. And one of the programs that we have is the Spotlight Initiative. And the Spotlight Initiative is about a dozen years old. It was formed specifically to support independent film. We, have, we choose 10 films a year, both uh, features and docs and also shorts, uh, to spotlight and to bring our power of celebrity, our, um, our support, to, to these films. We go to film festivals to, we have a team that looks at the films. We, we ask for submissions um, so that we can spotlight and support your films. We also produce um, a film probably about every 18 months and we sometimes find funding for films. So we encourage you, please go to our website, uh, www.thecreativecoalition.org. Send us your, your features, send us your films, send us your scripts. And we, that's our whole purpose in this particular program is to support independent film. And this year we were so happy to be able to um, raise uh, grant money to, um, to give out to filmmakers uh, for four short films. We have three of our winning filmmakers here uh, on, and we picked various issues. And this year's issue is the untold story of obesity. Um, the grant was made possible by uh, Nova Nordisk Inc. 
And we were then able to give the grant uh, to, as I said, to four, four filmmakers to create four shorts on this issue of obesity. And why obesity? Why, do, why have we gotten behind that issue? Well, it's funny because it's an, it's an issue um, that is the biggest epidemic besides COVID that affects the world. In the United States, it affects four out of 10 Americans. And yet it is sort of an orphan disease that nobody talks about, that we avert our eyes to, that we find shameful, that is treated like perhaps alcoholism was a dozen years ago or mental illness or epilepsy a hundred years ago. If one were a better person, if they um, had more willpower, these things wouldn't happen. And we know that's not true. And so what we're doing is how do we use the arts to bring this issue of obesity and bring the issue that it is a disease that, that is, uh, that where there's treatments available, where people who have it are not alone, how do we bring that to the forefront? And we know of no better way than independent film. Um, so we, we had a competition this year. Three of our um, recipients of the grants are here. The Emmy nominated actress, Kelly Jenrett, uh, the Emmy and Tony Award winner, David Gallo, and the spectacular film writer of some of your favorite uh, films, saving, including Saving Silverman and Bride Wars, um, uh, Greg DePaul. So they are three of our recipients and I was so pleased that they would uh, accept the award with the Creative Coalition and are here for a little panel, if that's okay. And um, David, we're encouraging questions, right? Yes, so uh, if anyone has, we'll have a question and answer portion later in the hour. Uh, so if anyone has questions while we go on, just add your question to the chat box and then we'll have Aiden, who is our voice in the sky, running the tech operations here. He'll uh, call out to you, Robin, any of the questions when you're ready. And yeah, we were calling it a talk back. So please give us questions so we can talk back. Um, so let's start with David. And David, I, and it was we, everyone. We, we also, just, Robin, have your PSA. Uh, if oh, that's, thank you. Time. Thank you, David Rubenstein. Um, why don't we show, we did start the, um, when we started getting into an issue, one of the things we do is create a public service announcement to get it out to this message out to broad audiences. So uh, Aiden, if you would play the PSA and get us in the mood. Hey. 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 So here's a little more bad news about coronavirus. Excess body weight can make getting COVID-19 even more serious. More serious. Like increasing your risk of hospitalization. And severe illness. It's scary. Scary. Get the facts on COVID and obesity. COVID and obesity. Look. Four out of 10 Americans live with obesity. So if that's you or someone you know. You're not alone. You are not alone. The hopeful news is that we're all in this together. Together. And help is out there. Help is out there. So take extra care. Check in with a healthcare provider. And find out what you can do to protect your health. It could save your life. 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 So that's what we do. How do you use the arts to change the world in a, in a good way? Um, and I want to start with David Gallo. David, I know, um, you know you, you have conquered television, the stage. Why did, the, why did you do this besides me saying to nagging at you, David, you should, you should, uh, you should uh, look at this uh, competition. Why? Well, why did this think issue it's... speak to you? Why did filmmaking speak to you? Well, the, you know, I've made a number of, of short pieces and you know, shot a bunch of stuff for the various things that I've done over the years but never actually a movie or anything that you'd call a movie, um, but had always wanted to, and actually film was my first love. Theater was something that I went into um, early on, uh, but, but film was something that I was actually more interested in in the beginning and then set that aside for the next 40 years. But then when this came around, it was particularly appealing to me because I thought, I realized I was able to make something that was autobiographical. You know, I was, 
I was a few years ago, I was 300 pounds and had been struggling with my weight for most of my, most of my entire life and ended up getting uh, weight reduction surgery, which worked very, very well in my case. And so I was able to make a film that covered my own experience all the way up, even through the surgery and, 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 and something that kind of revealed in, in 24 and a half minutes, what, you know, that life is like. So. Greg, what about you? You're a screenwriter. You've done feature films. Why is short and why is short on this issue? I think shorts are a great opportunity to get right to what you, you know, to, 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 to get right to the point and to, like a great short story, whether it's O. Henry or somebody else in that, that sense. And I, I thought it was a great opportunity for a, a great cause. And, you know, it, it also touches on a lot of, it touches my family a lot. So it was something I was very concerned with. What, what was the biggest challenge in making a short? Because you've certainly written some very um, spectacular and successful full-length movies. How about a short? I mean, you, you're, st you're still in edit with your film and I know it's about five to eight minutes. What's, why a short? Well, uh, what was the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge, well, also I was directing. I don't have as much experience directing. I've worked with a lot of actors. Um, you know, doing it during COVID, honestly, was part of the difficulty that we faced. Um, but, but, but since I like to sneak up on people, I like a story to start with a bit of a misdirection. You might think it's about one thing and then it surprises you and it's something else. You know, there, you have a short window of opportunity to do that, to present, to present your subject, kind of seduce people or entertain them quickly, and then kind of turn it quickly without maybe being too pedantic or seeming like you're lecturing them. And I think that was what I was hoping to accomplish. Well, I can't wait to see the next version of it because I know it's an edit Thanks. and working on it. Um, Kelly, what about you? Why, why, did you why, why did you get involved in this? Well, I think um, the statistics spoke uh, very heavily to me. Four out of five African-American women um, have obesity. And it's not something that we talk about in the African-American community like the title of my film. We just say, oh, you just big bone. And I wanted to help to create something that would start conversations in our community so that we wouldn't be afraid to say the word obesity and to hopefully get help um, with that disease. You know, we don't even know that it is a disease. I didn't know um, that it was a disease and, and approaching it from that perspective was definitely helpful and eye-opening. So. I just wanted to create something that would start conversations. David, what about you? You're, the genre that you um, that your film is, it's a silent movie and it's also, there's some music. It's, it's somewhat of- Yeah, I call it, a, it's called a silent musical. It's, um, it's, it's a, it doesn't have any dialogue. It's, it's, it's done, you know, as a, as a sort of classic uh, silent film <laughs> um, show, picture show. But there's a tremendous, the entire thing is scored and it's an original score from beginning to end. I do everything to music. Music is the most important element. And so we scored it much as we could first and then, and then wrote it, created it, and then scored it on top of that. So the, 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 the reason for that, there's a number of reasons, but in order to make an entire lifetime in 24 and a half minutes, 25 minutes, uh, I used a lot of musical numbers. And so rather than show an entire courtship, I did a waltz, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it saved me a lot of time using musical numbers versus, plus I'm a musical theater guy. So I can't, I can't help myself. How did you cast it? How did you well, go about casting? Well, one of the, again, I set up so many guardrails for myself to make this doable, you know? And so one of them was to cast from a, a, a world that I'm familiar with and that's the circus world. And so I had seen, Mariko, uh, our female lead, a woman, she uh, I had seen on stage in a number of, of, of variety shows. She's a brilliant, you know, brilliant physical comedian. And then Danny, um, I had seen but never met. Um, um, same there. And then the rest of our cast, our cast of thousands, also acted as our crew and our puppeteers and all that other, other business. So we were, we were used, you know, every part of the pig, as it were, when we when we made this. And so they were all chosen their particular skills. Circus people can rig things, they can build things, they can perform in a scene, drop it and make a costume. So those were the people that we needed. Kelly, you, you have children in yours and you're dealing with a pretty hard subject. 
Wow. How did you, uh, how did you manage that? That real life didn't bleed into the film and film, you know, with the, when the camera stopped. T- tell us about that. Yeah, um, a lot of prayer <laughs> and support, <laughs> support from, from the team, from their families. Uh, the, sh- the short opens up with a scene with our lead actor, um, Shelly, being bullied by what we call mean girls. And before we even shot, I had a Zoom meeting with the parents, with the little girls, and I just explained to them that this was acting and that they were gonna be saying some very mean things so that when we said cut, we needed to make sure that we cut and we didn't continue to go on with the taunting um, and just to kind of encourage them and let them know that if at any time anybody felt uncomfortable or sad or any kind of feelings that they could, you know, feel free to have a conversation with us, but it was really important that we talk to them about how hard it would be. The irony in this is this, sti- you know, there is this obesity that's this whispered, untold, avert your eyes disease, yet you all had a cast within that. Um, Greg, tell me about your casting. Uh, well, I mean, it's basically two, two men who are in, a, in a, essentially an Uber, and I mean, I remember I talked with a number of the doctors that I think you set me up with. Um, one was in Nashville and another was in Boston who specialize in, in obesity treatments uh, and, dealing, and dealing with people struggling with obesity. And one thing that came out was that they felt that the range of what we might visually think of as obese is wider than what most of us realize. So I think it was their hope that someone was cast who wasn't so overtly uh, obese that then they're easily dismissed by the average viewer. So I was trying to kind of go a little bit towards you know, a, a slightly gray area, middle zone, so that people would think, well, gosh, that could be my uncle too, or my father or whatever. Uh, so that was part of the casting. And, and um, you know, and, and they, had to, they had to feel like real people, obviously. Chloe, what about you, challenges? Yeah, there were challenges. Um, because as I said, like in, in the African-American community, we don't talk about obesity. And so there was a lot of trepidation with myself, with my casting director, as we were putting out the breakdowns. You know, we didn't know how to word um, what we were looking for, for fear that either people wouldn't submit or that they would be offended. Um, but there were people that I know, people that my director knew, and we were able to reach out to them. And surprisingly enough, um, they were excited to be a part of it because I've I've heard a few of them talk about how they feel invisible and not seen. And to be able to share this story in a way that made them feel seen was really helpful. So a lot of the, a lot of our casting came from people that we knew or people that we knew who knew other people. So that, that was really helpful. What this goes out to, I guess, Greg or any, anyone to chime in, you all have you know, worked on feature films, feature, you know, you've worked on television series. What is the, the biggest difference in, um, in, in, in you're all, I think, first time direct or producers here and Greg, you're directing and David, you directed as well, right? What was, what was Greg, let's start with you, your biggest challenge. Uh... The, the biggest challenge was just dealing with the with the with the imponderables, the weather, all these things. If we're going to drive around, you know, I, I I think I naively thought putting two people in a car and keeping it there was a way to con- contain things. And in one sense, it was. Is also they're very difficult angles to film from. You know, I had to get oh. the right cinematographer who could really scrunch down and, and the rigging and all that. That's a physical thing, you know. I'm just saying, I, I Kelly, say what, from, uh, uh, David. Go ahead. Just, just, the, just trying to keep it going. The challenges you're saying that we, we encountered yeah. the um, Zoom rehearsal. Uh, you know, when you're making a making a, 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 a any kind of a story, any type of a film, but one that's you know silent requires stories to be told in extremely subtle gesture because it's a serious movie. There's not a single you know it's the, it's not slapstick and there's not one fat joke in the whole movie, but it is done with you know archetypical silent characters, and so we mostly rehearsed. Um, via Zoom and had one in-person rehearsal, um, but it was just, it was a nightmare. And we had full musical numbers we had to rehearse, you know, and luckily I have the, 
I have a workspace here that I can actually rehearse it. It was big, as big as the set, but still, um, I would say a lack of rehearsal. When it came down to shooting it, it was time more than anything else. But again, when I talk guardrails, I mean, we had created an environment where we were able to shoot it. Mistakes were fine. We, Bob Ross was one of our big heroes. You know, happy accidents happened every day. Um, so the actual filming went pretty smoothly, but again, you know, far, far too quickly. Yeah. That's so the biggest challenge was, of course, yeah. post-production because I'd never done that before. I hadn't also <laughs> thought about the Zoom rehearsals, which you all had to do, I assume, in some way, shape or form. What, what was the, the key to that, um, Kelly? I mean, did you do Zoom rehearsals or what, what did, how did you do it? We did a Zoom table read. And we shot um, over three days in Atlanta. And um, we, the, the only thing that we did via Zoom were the, um, was the table read. And to answer the challenge question, it was COVID. You know, um, a lot of people were kind of saying like in Atlanta, you know, they were kind of like, what pandemic? And people <laughs> were, <laughs> you know, going around uh, living, living life like normal. And we ran into quite a few challenges. We lost um, two people on the production side due to testing positive for COVID. Wow. We lost um, two, two or three actors who tested positive for COVID. So, um, you know, that was the challenge. And then we also, we shot in three different locations, but those were uh, places that we had connections with. So we were, you know, kind of able to maneuver around that way. But as far as Zoom, it was just the just a table read. Greg, did you so most of, almost all of your your um, film takes place in an Uber? Did was did was it actually driving? Did you have it on as, as a stationary, or how did you do that? We, we I mean, it would been so expensive to drag it, and so no, uh, that was all me hiding in the back and rigging on the car and just drive we we drove around for hours back and forth through a park here in new jersey all of that uh was just on the move so then the actor has to be able to drive and do his line so he can't take risks but it, it creates a nervousness that i didn't expect you know it was definitely harder than i thought oh yeah i mean that's pretty sophisticated no i'm being serious pretty sophisticated driving and doing your life it, absolutely the biggest feature films of the most significant you know they're not doing that right right so yeah, that was a hard one to learn. I mean, I, I totally agree with everything that Kelly just said about and then the COVID problem and the who knows who might test out the day before. David, you had a significant number of people in the cast. Did you, how did you deal with COVID? Well, we had, you know, my partner and I, we had actually just come off of a reality series. And so we had learned a lot of very hardcore uh, professional COVID procedures from that. And so we, we weren't able to budget in all the COVID compliance officer, but we did um, attain the role of that. And so everybody was tested, um, you know, regularly and um, the crew and people that were all seen in silhouette, you only see two actual actors in the entire movie, everybody else is in silhouette, all wore masks at all times. Um, and we just, you know, kept people as separated as we could, but it was a drag and it was dealt, we dealt with it as best we could. And, it, you know, I mean, we, yeah, it we was did online training courses and all this other stuff. So, um, but, you know, it worked out fine. But like I said, we had we had an example to learn from and we're uh, even more thorough than the television series was. Kelly, you also deal with one of the scenes in your film is comedy. And it was interesting because um, I think, David, you said there are no fat jokes in our, you know, in our film. So that must have been pretty, how did you navigate the comedy part of yours? Well, it, it actually was, is based on um, a true experience that I had. I went to a comedy show and the comedian was talking about how women refer to themselves as big boned and how there were no fat skeletons. You know, he just, he couldn't understand that and so, I think it was just allowing the comedian to tell his joke, but still focusing on what that did to our main character, how that affected her, and even allowing it to be funny to her. You know, it's this reality of like, 
yeah, there are no fat skeletons. So let's talk about this whole big bone thing that, that we say, you know? And so I feel like it just kind of helped, like there was laughter from our main actor um, after, after tears, you know, it was, it's painful to hear that in a comedy show because what was happening, she was getting ready to leave and, you know, he um, started talking or heckling her. Um, but we, the focus was more on Shelly, our main character, than on the comedian and allowing her to have an experience with that so that we as the audience could be brought in to that experience as well. I know with the children in there, did you, um, did you brief the kids? How, how much did you brief the kids before about the issue? Um, well, I told them that this was loosely based on my life and that um, growing up, they used to call me heavy duty and they used to say, Kelly, shake that belly. And so, you know, I, I understood and that we would be talking about something that was really difficult. Um, I didn't go into too much detail um, with, with them about what obesity is, but we did talk about um, obesity. They were there for the entire table read. Um, and I really took the lead from the parents. You know, I had a conversation with the parents and to see how they wanted to, to move forward. I was spending three days with them um, and, and then they had to spend forever with them. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't overstepping my bounds, but I had pretty um, detailed conversations with the parents in hopes that they would have conversations with their girls. But the girls all knew that if they had questions at any time, they could have a conversation. After having done the three of you having tackled this issue uh, in short form, you know, it's an, it's, and you've all been in, you know, television, movies, theater, and surprisingly, it's been an issue since time began that really hasn't been dealt with. Happily, we are dealing with body positivity and, and, and um, the entertainment industry has taken that on. From your own experiences, why do you think that this, you know, it's, it's again, it's this avert your eyes issue. And, and after having done your own short on this, what do you think the biggest challenges are going to be to bring this into the forefront, like mental illness was brought in or any other issue? I'm, look, I'm looking for how to do it. <laughs> I would say, you know, my film is very positive surgery. And we had, you know, we all had the same medical advisors and they were very positive surgery, my own doctor. I looked into surgery about 10 years ago, eight years ago, and it was all this, you know, well, see if it's right for you, come to this lecture, read this book, you know? And then I went three years ago and they said, get it or don't get it. If you're not gonna get it, get out of my office. <laughs> it was just do it. And I know it's expensive. I know not everybody can afford it, especially the recovery and all that other business. But I think that if people realized that there really was a medically understood and available solution that was safer than carrying all that weight, um, that, that would really help. You can't do another eat fruits and vegetables and exercise campaign. It's just not gonna work. You know, it's you funny, know? Uh, not funny, but it's, uh, you, know, you, you're one of the masterminds of Sesame Street. And Sesame Street certainly has brought almost every issue to the forefront in the most spectacular way. Do you think this is, I mean, not that you're speaking for Sesame Street, but what do you think the hurdles would be? The hurdles to be for there to be a character on Sesame Street that was overweight? That had obesity. I don't know. I, I can tell you that that place is like NASA. Like they have characters with issues planned 10 years in advance. Like they are, I'm sure. You know, they tried to deal with food issues and control issues with um, Cookie Monster and it didn't go well. So now Cookie Monster is all about just self-control and it doesn't matter what. Oh, it, it didn't food. go well. What, ha what happened? They... they tried to convince people that Cookie Monster could exist on, on, on fruits and vegetables, you know, and there was the whole campaign was cookies are a sometimes food and it just didn't work. And wow. so they went back to Cookie Monster because Cookie Monster is six. A lot of people don't realize that. So it returned to Cookie Monster being insane about cookies, but he's also, his difficulty is self-control in all things, you know? So I don't know, but I, 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 it's funny, interesting. I guarantee you somebody's working on an obese character. 
I, I can't imagine that they're not doing that. But you got to remember how long it takes, how many studies, tests, marketing, redo. Like it, it's pretty, it's a laboratory. It, the, the days of cutting some felt out and putting it on your hand and going, hi, I'm the overweight character. That is a long gone. <laughs> Craig, what about in feature films? I mean, to get an issue into in, in a feature film, I mean, you certainly are, you've written films, you're a script doctor, you're, you know, you're, you're the guy. Well, I don't, I think that there's sort of two ways to approach it. One is that the subject matter can be the struggle with obesity, et cetera. And of course, we've seen some of that in TV with This Is Us and some other shows, you know, where it's at least a subject of, of one part of the story. But, but I think in, in feature films, I mean, I, I'd love to see it. I mean, I feel like in ensemble work, it just should become, you know, more common that they're there and that each story is unique and different. And, and you're not going to know someone's unique and I try to touch on this in my piece, you're not going to know someone's unique story until you ask them and looking at someone and thinking, you know, their whole history is not going to work. You yeah. know, what they should or shouldn't be doing. You don't know everybody's, there's a whole, and that came out with the doctors that, that spoke to me through you, Robin, there's just a whole host of hurdles that individuals have things they may or may not have tried. And if you're not going to be friends with them enough to ask, then please don't throw anything at them. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Kelly, you're you know, in you're you know, you've made certainly made a significant mark in television, whether it's The Handmaid's Tale or your new CW show, um, the Amer the all the, the all Americans, right, or the all all American Homecoming, yeah, the all American Homecoming, <laughs> and you you know, and you work with writers, and you're you know, you're you're constantly going through scripts. What do you think a challenge in or is there a challenge in television, or do you just put something out there and? Uh, yeah, I think it's always going to be a challenge, you know, as Greg mentioned, you know, them touching on it in, in This Is Us, I think, like he said, if we make it more commonplace, each story, like Greg said, I talked with the doctors as well, even understanding that the terminology is you have obesity, because obesity is a disease, you wouldn't say to a cancerous person, I mean, you wouldn't call someone who has cancer, you're, you're cancerous, you'd say they have cancer. And so I think just having, just start with having the conversation and finding out what people have done because as Greg said, it's not a one size fits all, you know, David touched on, you can't just say, hey, eat fruits and veggies and work out and, and you'll be okay. So I think it's just opening up the conversation and understanding that this is not a one size fits all disease, but that it is a disease. David, you have a question, right? Yeah, so I mean, you know, in my, in my own experience working with or speaking with other people who have, you know, body image issues or things like that, you know, one of the common things that people bring up is uh, the idea of the saying that we just say for granted, right? I feel fat. Right. That's a very common, you know, people might say something, I feel fat or whatever. Well, fat's not a feeling. Right. That it, 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 but it's colloquially used that way. When, when you each of you were putting together your films, uh, did you get pushback from people when they, you told people I'm, I'm doing a film on obesity or I'm doing it on this on this issue in terms of the language you were using or how you were phrasing certain things? Yeah, yes. I did for sure. Um, I had a conversation with a girlfriend of mine and, you know, it was this idea of like, yeah, but sometimes we're just thick, you know, like we have these hips and thighs and, you know, uh, so how can you say that someone is obese uh, when they're just thick? And so trying to have that conversation and, and being open and honest enough to say, hey, I'm still figuring this out as well. And talking with the doctor and understanding that obesity is not so much about your hips and thighs, but around the belly area where your organs are going to be affected and just having, having that conversation. But it was very much like, here we go again, you know, somebody telling us something's wrong with us. And it's like, that's not that's not what this is at all. So there was, there was some pushback. And how about you, Greg or David? And, and by the way, just mention, uh, for anyone who else wants to ask any questions, feel free to add them to the chat box and Aiden will, will call them out for us. Um, I would say that we, I got a number of pushback and I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question, but I'll do my best. I, when we first started casting, we actually put out a casting notice through the trades because I wanted to have everyone have an opportunity. And 
we weren't, we had one of the real difficulties we had is we had to have performers that we could pad up and then pad back down again, which left us hiring people to do fat face. If you know what, you know what I mean? It was, it was hard to believe that we were about to make a movie that, that, that showed the difficulties of being overweight and we we're going to use fat suits. Now we, we got some, some response to that that wasn't as people that weren't as happy about it necessarily which i think was a little bit of pushback um but in the end we were able to you know cast it and we we're very happy with what we did but had i to do over again i would have considered more people because it turned out that their actual size wasn't that important to making the movie um but there was a it was a just i think there was a bit of that for me i, I would just oh i'm sorry no, i would ahead. just Oh, thank you. I would just say that um, the, the subject of it being a disease, which is definitely comes up, it's in the script in my piece. Um, and I'm so glad uh, that some people express some reservations or concerns about that. But I feel like, you know, after hearing the information that I got through the coalition, uh, I was a lot better able to kind of like deal with that and explain that and try to work that in. Um, I have a question, you know, so we, so here's an issue that we've all, that we're dealing with and we're bringing to the screen. Have any of you, Kelly, Paul, David, um, have there ever been times when you've been asked to work on um, a film, a movie, a television show, a, a stage play that had an issue that you did not agree with how it was being presented? Did you ever have to deal with that? I don't think that I ever did. I know that sounds weird having done so many plays and our industry over the so years. Perfect. Well, it isn't even that. It's a certain type of people write Broadway plays. And I think that they, they usually come from a place that either I'm unfamiliar with, so I can't say, or are familiar with and, and, and tend, tend to agree with. I, I wish I had a more spectacular answer, but I don't, I don't think that I have. Or are there any issues that you got to work on? through your craft that you feel like did make a difference? Well, yeah, I think I've done a number of things over the years that have made a difference. You know, Not only that, just the responsibility of doing a Broadway play or musical for the first time, because then that production becomes the template for you know, the next hundred years, so. What, what, was, what, what were one of your templates that you worked on? Well, it's any Broadway premiere. You know, Thoroughly Modern Millie will be tap dancing desks will be in that show until the end of time. And the only reason that they're in there is because I had no other way to bring that many desks out on stage. So I had the women sit in them and tap dance them on. It's the most famous number in the show. And it really, I really, I didn't know what else to do. You know, so that happens a lot over the years. There's a Murphy bed in the, in, in, in the drowsy chaperone that's really a part of the staging now. And I just, I just put it in there so because I had no other way to get the bed off stage. But amateurs find it really hard to do because Murphy beds are not a simple thing to do. So you have that responsibility. Craig, what about you with writing films and well, doctoring films? The first question that you asked, it made me, and because we're talking about obesity and weight, and it, uh, I was asked to rewrite, and I did. I worked for a while on, it didn't get made. It was a spoof that was going to be based heavily on the, the movie, uh, even though it came out years before that, of uh, Titanic. And uh, the president of production at the studio just was adamant that we have more weight jokes. Uh, 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 the, the woman playing the, the unsinkable Molly Brown, Kathy Bates. He really just wanted to turn this into a joke about her weight, wow. uh, you know, and really, and I just felt that, that was just, it just made me uncomfortable. Like we can't go, we can't do anything smarter than that. You know what I mean? Like that's what we're going to do. So. So did you turn it down or did you? Uh... Well, I, I we was, we were in the, I was in, had already been hired. It just, it became a, a I just couldn't produce that, that this felt like it was going, but I could do a lot better work than that. Kelly, how about you? I, with David, I, there isn't anything that I can think of um, in the issue that I did not agree with. Um, but like my mama says, I'm just gonna keep on living. I'm sure something will come. Robin, we have uh, some questions from the audience here. Aiden, would you mind reading out some of the questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question here from Rachel. Uh, what are your thoughts on characters in TV slash sitcoms whose personality trait is, I used to be obese, like Monica on Friends or Schmidt on New Girl? Or you might not know about these characters, but. I don't really know anything about that. I don't, 
don't have those references, but I spend a fair amount of time saying that I used to be obese as sort of the John the Baptist of weight loss surgery um, or, or whatever will save your life medication, that sort of stuff. So I would say that um, I don't have any problem hiding that fact, you know, and was pretty well known for being pretty huge. But my own, the only thing that bothers me in my own vanity is I hate it when somebody digs up an old picture on the internet and puts it up as my headshot because <laughs> my head's like this big. <laughs> That's just vanity. I wanted to go back to a technical um, question for a second. And, and again, because of our audience of filmmakers, um, you had a very you know tight, all your budgets were very tight. Then it was compounded by COVID. Then, um, you know, there was a, and it was, you know, it had to be a short film. Um, any tricks that you learned or that you can pass on in, how do you keep, I mean, David, it sounds like you became a COVID compliance officer, which I'm just gonna say that in case that, <laughs> that we broke anything by you being a self-appointed COVID compliance officer. But um, how did you manage that? How did you manage staying on budget? Kelly, well, you have some- Are you talking to me or? Anyone, you, had some, you all had some very complicated scenes. I made my rules very fast and hard and fast from the very beginning. I said, no dialogue. So I don't have to rehearse epic scenes. I can use musical numbers instead. Um, single set, the entire thing takes place in a circular circus tent. Really simple, we made it ourselves. Um, used all of the people for double and triple duty. Created, my two, my biggest influences in this is not a joke, was, was, was Bob Ross with Happy Accidents and Ed Wood. I mean, we really shot it Ed Wood style. And the idea being that if a mistake was made, if it was the good take, we would just use it. I mean, there's one point where the cinematographer is backing up and he trips on a bunch of clothes and you hear him go, oh, fuck. And the whole thingy on the top of the camera drops down and kills 10% of the frame. We used that shot, you know, because it was the best take. Uh, and we, oh, the other thing is I created really long takes. Each scene is a single take. There's no actual editing in the movie. And so all of those things allowed me to create these rules so I could be as creative as possible within those rules. And that's the only way we're able to afford it. You know? so, would you, so would you say that your trick or your, you know, what, what your mantra is, is that you made it simple, you stuck to the rules? Yeah, we made rules for ourselves and then we stuck to them. And, and how did, but as a creative, I mean, you're one of the most creative people that I know. From that's a creative a lot, standpoint. I, I represent the Creative Coalition. But how do you, how did you keep from deviating? Oh, they okay. I storyboarded every microsecond of the film. Um, even though there was no script, there was a storyboard. Every gesture was storyboarded. Every I will attest, camera Dave move, was a big storyboard. Every every single aspect of it was storyboarded ahead of time. So we weren't, you know, and then once we got there, we were able to be creative on top of that. But it was, it was for a movie that looks like it was made like a bunch of putzes, you know, with a, with a camera. I guess it was, but um, it was very carefully planned out, you know. So, you know, that allowed us, we knew what every shot was going to cost. We knew how long we had to shoot it. We knew what it had to do. Was there any, ever a time that you were like, oh, this is not working? All your no. planning, all your storyboarding? No. Cool. I want <laughs> you to run my life, storyboard my life. <laughs> we do. I mean, we do, we do things like that. But, you know, because this is a weird thing here, but, you know, we, we did made this movie and budget was tight and we all loved making a handmade together, but we do the same thing with things that have, you know, $10 million. Like everything we do here is... You all, you all do the same thing, I'm sure. It's, you have different senses of scale to everything that you do. And when you went to make your movie about obesity, you had to focus in and use all of your skills, you know, um, um, to make this one beautiful, beautiful little thing. Kelly, what about you? You had some complicated stuff going on. How did you stick to the budget? Uh, again, a lot of prayer. And, uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and and um, just asking, so... Uh, we did have a COVID compliance officer. It was really important, especially since we were shooting in Atlanta and things were just very interesting here. Uh, we had three locations. One house was used for the dinner scenes in the kitchen. That was my parents' house. They said yes um, and didn't disown me, so I'm grateful for that. 
Then uh, we had the comedy, uh, comedy store. That was a, um, you know, we reached out, had people there and they allowed us to come in. Uh, another, the house that we were using for the bedrooms that fell through at the last minute. So we uh, ended up using the house of our cinematographer. He had a, an amazing house and allowed us to use it. So there were, there, there was a lot of just asking for favors and, um, you know, smiling really nice and praying really hard and it all worked out and we were able to, to stay on budget. And with all of the hiccups, I just, I had such an amazing team. Like I think the trick for me was having an amazing team that when we were presented with challenges or obstacles, nobody panicked. It was like, okay, now let's put our heads together and figure out how we're going to find a place for us to shoot on Sunday, even though it's Thursday. And, and we figured it out and made it happen and cut ourselves a film. Do you, I have something a little more specific for you. You know, you're used to working on big budget films, studio films. Um, how did you, um, how did you, you frame your movie and frame, you know, your head around, it's a very limited budget. I mean, besides like hiding in cars and being flexible physically, how, what, what did you do? I mean, cause this was a quite, a, it was a departure from studio films. That's Greg, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. you still, I apologize. Um, how is it a departure from the studio films or because yeah in um, every way I'm sure but how did you wrap your head around it uh, I, I guess it was it's sort of a, a bit of what David said a bit of what Kelly said which is I guess my biggest boundary in, as a way to get my, how I'm going to do this was that I was going to try to keep everything to the home like the headquarters of my home we ended up you shooting in my van which is beat up and old so it it, it, it worked and 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 with people that, that actors I knew, but also with people in my sort of my town, my neighborhood. So everything was kind of localized so that at least I could always just feel sincere about it and know that it was a sincere expression of how I felt about the subject matter. Um, that, that really helped me a lot. That helped me kind of keep wrap my head around it and keep it kind of small and, and specific. And you have one ending, which I know we haven't decided on yet, with kids in it. And they happen to be your kids. I mean, that, it sounds like that was also a way to get some more cast members in yes and for cheap <laughs> you know <laughs> i'll represent them next time right my, exactly. kids, were, my kids built the tent and they were expensive <laughs> <laughs> don't don't let them talk to greg's kids <laughs> robin we would like to um you know as we're wrapping up here we would like to take this opportunity to present uh to the creative coalition our independent filmmaker day excellence in filmmaking award and for their work and bringing to life these short films you big boned past life excuse me fat life and saint nick and we're very grateful and thankful to have kelly jen red david gallo and greg DePaul here to welcome uh, and just for a final tell us tell our audience where we can find your films where are they going to be shown how can we all have well if anyone is connect where we are submitting to film festivals um aggressively um, and we are um, looking at different festivals to submit to. Uh, and we're looking to have them premiere at festivals this year or this coming fall and um, winter. So if you're connected to a festival and you're interested, let us know, shoot us an email um, and you'll be seeing our filmmakers on the circuit. And we are going to be, and one of our jobs at the Creative Coalition is to blow it out, is to make a big deal. We make mountains out of mountains. <laughs> so, um, and I really want to thank, I mean, we wouldn't be here and we'll also be, um, we, we share this award with Kelly, David, and Greg, who we are just, we're the collators. They are the creatives. So thank you. And thank you, David. And we love being part of Independent Film Day because that's what we believe in. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're now going to take a little bit of a break, about 10 minutes, and we'll be back at the top of the hour for our next panel. But thank you so much.